Oh, look at that. Look. Look what's under there. Do you see it? Is it really possible to fix a car's major electrical systems after they've been in a saltwater flood? It's really dependent on where each of these systems are contained within the car and how high the water rose. If you look at the auction photos from our Aston, they show a flood line about a third of the way up the doors, which seems pretty accurate based on the water line and the carpet of the interior. Considering this, I'm pretty hopeful as the water didn't seem to make its way into the center console area or even up to the lower portions of the dashboard. But what we did find in the passenger side footwell was this major junction box that was beyond savable. Past this, it's been difficult to look for much anything else as the power seats are stuck in their current positions, which are pretty much slid all the way back and lowered to the floor. Right now, we've got to figure out a sensible solution to removing these seats so we can explore around the interior and find what else might be in the way of reviving this once $286,000 DBS. It's not going to be easy, but if we can actually get this Aston Martin working, it'll be the definition of a great value exotic, which is very fitting since I'm known to shop Walmart's automotive section on a weekly basis. I'm confident that the electronic components we'll need right off the bat here won't break the bank, but what would kill this deal is an Aston drivetrain replacement. The V12 engine out of this DBS alone would cost more than the price I paid for the entire car. That's not even considering a replacement transmission or differential. So let's start first by inserting inspecting our drivetrain. Even though we're able to get the Aston in neutral and roll it, well, the steering wheel is still stuck straight. So we can't turn that wheel and pull the car over there to the barn, which means that this is going to remain a field car until we get some life back into it to make my life a whole lot easier and to reduce the amount of trips running back and forth to the barn to grab tools. Well, I brought out my mobile tool kit. This is a Hart 215 piece mechanics tool kit that comes with pretty much everything you need to work on pretty much any job you need on any car and it's super portable. We got our half inch and three eighths ratchets up top along with a slew of different deep and shallow sockets. We open up the lower drawer here. There's our quarter inch, but what we need at the moment is right here, a T30 torque socket in order to take that shroud out of the engine bay. Admittedly, this is not exactly what I was looking for, but we get a better look at our coolers and a better look at the inside of our engine bay here with that shroud off. What I wanted to see were the air filters that come off of either one of those air filter inlets there. And uh, it looks like those, instead of going straight out, I thought they'd be like located under here. They go down and they probably breathe fresh air through that little vent. So it looks like we're gonna probably have to get this car up in the air. I'm guessing we're gonna find it behind the bumper, maybe behind the wheel liner here, but just at a first glance, there's no excessive dirt or muck, you know, stuff that we saw on our flooded Dodge Viper, stuff that we saw even on the Corvette. This car is exceptionally clean. The only thing I'm really seeing here is a corroded crank pulley. I'm guessing that's probably because it's made out of steel and an oil filter that looks to be in a really tight space. And from everything I've read, you do the oil filter on the top of this car. So that's gonna be fun when we get to it right now. Let's get underneath and see if we can't find our air filters. All right, we've got our undershield off, which gives us access to everything we need. And behind this wheel well liner, we found our air box. There it is. All right. And you know what? This does not look as bad as it could have looked. This filter is nothing like any of the other flood cars uh, that we took apart the air boxes on. It's not crunchy. It's not all dried out and shrunk. Uh, it's not caked with sand or anything. I do see these little spots, which could be mold spores maybe, but uh, otherwise, it wouldn't. I wouldn't hesitate to start the engine with the filters in the condition that they're in currently. Uh, we could definitely replace them, but that's something we'll do when we get there. Working on this car outside and on the ground with the lift just a few yards away does leave a little bit to be desired, but I will tell you, everything is looking really great so far, and it's coming apart really pretty effectively, very quickly. I'd attribute a lot of that to this guy right here. This is the Hyper Tough Electric. 
cordless ratchet tool that is an amazing one to have and it's just one of the many tools and products we'll be using throughout this build that I picked up over at Walmart. That electric ratchet and that tool kit, you can really tackle any job and what's really amazing is because I got it all over at Walmart, the prices are ridiculous. Like that electric ratchet is about one quarter the price of one that you'll find at the regular hardware store. That tool kit, if you had to price out every individual ratchet and socket, it would be insane. But again, since it's over at Walmart, the stuff is super affordable. So I'm going to go ahead and drop links to both of those tools and a lot of other stuff I use on the regular, like this rechargeable underhood LED work light for under $25 or a 700 amp jump starter for less than 36 bucks. There's no reason to call an expensive tool truck anymore when you can hop on Walmart's website, order this stuff up and have it delivered directly to your door. Or if you're in a pinch, you can do an in-store pickup. It's all made super easy. The prices are unbeatable and it's all over at Walmart. All right, Mike, I'm expecting straight oil. We want straight oil. All we saw on the dipstick was straight oil. If we have oil, let's go ahead and plug it up. If we see water, well, it's the first thing we're gonna see because it's denser. Here we go. Just trying to get a little drip here. Oh, there we go. I see oil coming down there. So we got no water. It could be a little. Yeah, no. see it coming on my hand. It's just oil. I see oil. I'll go a little bit looser. Go ahead. So there that, you go. That's straight oil. Yep. Plug it. Let's go. That's the most exciting oil drain plug pull I've ever seen in my life. With no mess. And the fact that you did it, Mike, well, that's impressive. I'm not even wrench. We're, we're... Oh, no, don't get my wrench all full of mess. What? Oh, that's well, my it's hard tool it's kit. I'm not yeah, but that's. These things happen. We're all clear on the engine. Now it's time to see what's going to come out of that transmission. Let's see. Your hand's in the way. Your hand's in the way. I can't see. What is that, water? That's oil. Okay, close it. Let's go. <laughs> Really? No no water. Nice in there. and clean in there too. Super clean. It looked clean and it looked a little bit gold. Yeah, it was very goldish. Okay. Reminds me of like the fluid for a Volkswagen Phaeton. That transmission looks very similar to a lot of ones on Range Rovers and also on BMWs. And I think it probably is the same exact transmission. So man. Two for three. All we gotta do is I'm check that diff it. right behind you and pray. <laughs> There's no water and we've got an awesome drivetrain in this car. We're good on this. There you go. Awesome, close it up. Nice thing about this is that we've actually got a plug on the Corvette. We had to actually remove the entire differential from the car in order to service it. So this one is nice and easy. We're three for three. We can attempt to start this thing without really messing with the drivetrain. What's amazing to me is how similar these flood total cars can be in theory, but how different the damage manifests itself from car to car. The flood line on this Aston, according to the auction photos, is a very similar level to what we had on our Corvette ZR1. Both cars are low riding two door sports coupes, but on the Corvette, we had water in the engine, transmission and differential, but none in the interior. Our problems on the Aston are likely gonna be isolated to the interior. And we gotta start with the junction box that sits in the passenger side footwell. The one that originally came in the car was completely trashed by salt water. Pulling up the fuse diagram on a DBS, this junction box is responsible for crucial parts of the car that would clearly affect its operation and likely why we have very little life when we initially hooked up a battery jumper box. Luckily, this module is readily available as a used donor part out of a Volvo for about 50 to 100 bucks, so I bought one for $60 shipped and it came just a few days later. So let's just do this. Let's take that replacement junction box. Let's get under here. Let's just hook it up. But first, we'll go ahead. We'll clean all these harnesses with a bit of contact cleaner. I also have this little pin right here, which has a little bit of sandpaper on the end of it. That'll act as like a little rasp for anything that's obviously corroded, needs cleaning, where a uh, relay sits here and over here. With it all hooked up, if that gives us some electronic power to the car, along with a battery hooked up underneath the hood here, and it gives us that power we need to the seats, we'll be able to move these forward and then strip each interior component that was destroyed by the salt water. We'll be able to find whatever electronics might need some restoration or probably replacement, and that might just make this Aston Martin work again. All right, here we are all hooked up here. While I was cleaning and getting everything ready, I picked out, let's see here, one, two, three, four different terminals here that got stuck 
in some of these wiring connectors from the old junction box. So that thing was trashed, but this is relatively clean, at least on the inside. And again, everything's hooked up. So let's go get a battery under the hood and see if this brings the car to life. All right, here we go. I'm really looking forward to see what happens here. I am semi-confident, but I've been a little too confident this entire time. That's the first time I've ever heard this car make any other noise but that one little motor sound we had. Now, keys in my pocket. Let me get the right key out. Let's see if we hit this. Um, lock? So no response to this. That's, oh, there we go. Went off. What do we got going on? Oh, I forgot. There's a little ground under there that I didn't hook up. Oh, hello. Don't worry. Key. Let's just see what happens when we do this. Oh, we got a check engine. I saw a little light flash in there, but nothing else. Hold on. There's one tiny little ground that I did not hook up. It's a tiny little wire down there. Let me go hook it up really quick. See this little tiny guy right here? It is hooked up to one of the harnesses that runs off the, uh, the junction box here. So I'm gonna go ahead and put it there, put a nut to it and see if that changes what's going on. Unfortunately, hooking up this ground really didn't change the Aston's behavior at all. It's still really lifeless with the alarm siren continually ringing. But while we had battery power, I looked around and noticed a few of the accessory buttons were lit up. Hey, the glove box actually worked and one of the seat buttons that will electronically pop the seat forward was lit up. But when we hit it, nothing happened. The seat switches were still dead things were starting to look a bit bleak. In the moment, I had an idea as to why this replacement module wasn't really changing the car's behavior. I'm betting you that wherever this car's immobilizer is, well, it got some water in it and it's not happy. We'll follow up on that idea shortly, but about the seats, we still don't know what might live under them. But what I did figure out from a quick Google search is that a battery and a bunch of related electronics live behind the passenger seat. But the passenger seat is jammed completely against the rear one, so we can't get to that stuff. And remember, there's still no power to the seats themselves. We're currently running out of uninvasive options on this Aston Martin. The seat's gotta come out for us to get to all the electronics. I'm gonna snip one of the wiring harnesses I see going to the seat motor. We're gonna pull it forward as much as we can and try and send power directly to it. Uh, it will work only if the seat motors aren't completely trashed from the uh, flood. See that white and that purple wire right there? That runs directly to the seat motor and we had to cut it. We got a bit of length. On it, so now I can reach it right here. We're gonna try and send power directly to it with a little 12 volt battery and see if it moves the seat at all. Come on, we need to move the seat. Yeah, a little arc on there. Seat motor's trash, yeah? We're really screwed at this point. Come on, baby. Come on back, and the steering wheels. <clears throat> Oh, come on, baby. Sage, where am I on the... You're not hitting the door oh. card yet, no. Oh, I hit something. Oh, no. Okay, that just popped off. How about the pill or the bottom? You're looking good. A little oh, higher. Man. A little higher like that. There you got it. Just a little bit more. There you go. You're on this side. Now you're making it through the door panel. Uh -oh. You got room. You got about an inch over here. A couple inches. Keep coming. This way, yeah. Oh my god. Is it connected to anything on the bottom? No. You can pull it out. Okay. Man, I don't know how you got that out. I don't know either. It took a lot of swear <laughs> words. That was the most insane thing I've done in recent memory. I think manual swapping the entire Ferrari was easier than that. And that's just one. And that's the <laughs> technically unimportant seat. We need both of them up to get everything out, but we gotta get to the battery on the passenger side, so we better start that now if we wanna get before sundown. But let me show you while this seat is out of the car how we made this happen. Most simple power car seats have a few motors in them, specifically three motors in them. One moves the seat forward and back, 
Another motor will raise it up and down. Then the last motor is responsible for tilting the backrest down and up. We need to manipulate the motor that moves the slider forward and back so we can get to those rear seat bolts. Now look what we've done here. This is the cover to the forwardmost motor, which lives right here. See it? So here's the motor and it just had two bolts holding it in place, one on either side. I put a deep socket in, remove those two bolts, and then with the cover off, you can manually spin the motor by hand. As I spin it this way, each turn moves the seat forward just a smidge. I literally had to turn this motor like this for probably about 15 to 20 minutes before it gave us enough space to get to the rear seat bolts that hold the frame of the seat to the body of the car. I called multiple people and nobody had a solution for this except the last person I talked to, which was a guy named Matt over at E3 Customs. It's a upholstery shop down in South Florida. He just happened to have an Aston Martin in his shop at the time I called him. And he goes, let me look at the seats. I'm sure we could come up with a solution. And he told me exactly to do what I just showed you. So I got to give a huge thanks to Matt because if it wasn't for him, these seats might have not made it. And now, well, they're still in one piece and we're going to be able to pull these right up and out of the car. Now, there's hardly any clearance on this seat, so my hand's in a very awkward position and it's a slow process as it is, but as you spin this motor, uh, you can hear little creaks. It's moving the seat literally fractions of a millimeter each turn, so you can't visually see it moving forward, but when you hear those creaks, it's the leather rubbing up against other portions of the interior, you know it's moving. All right, my hand is super cramped from being stuck under that seat, but I think we've got just enough gap here to maybe get the rear cushion off and see if we can't find a battery back here somewhere. Oh yeah, look at that gap. This seat was literally touching the other one. There it is. We'll pull that out first. And here we go. Come on, baby. We just need a few, a few more millimeters here. Oh, look at that. Look. Look what's under there. Do you see it? I started just taking this apart in general to figure out what's going on. And obviously, it looks like a disaster. But, like, just take a look at this connector. When I unplugged it, look how clean it looks. Not to say that this doesn't need to be cleaned out, but there's a lot of stuff like this that's not half bad. Yes, this all needs some contact cleaner, but I think we can save a lot of this stuff with contact cleaner. Now, like all these fuses, even if they're not blown, they need to be replaced because they're going to be dead. But the other thing I'm noticing is this box, which I just unscrewed. I don't know what this is exactly, but you can see it says Ford Motor Company on it. So hopefully the part isn't a fortune, but specific little things like this or like some of those fuses over there can be the difference between this car powering up and not. Just did a quick store pickup over at Walmart, got a fresh battery for the Aston. And if you're not buying your car batteries over at Walmart, you're spending too much money. This battery had the same exact spec as the one at the auto parts store. And it costs like 80 bucks less, go figure. So we're making great progress and so far we even haven't spent all that much. We got that new battery, the spare junction box, we're really just a few hundred bucks in. But this thing, well, it looks important. So important that if you call the Aston Martin dealer, they want nearly $1,000 for it. But I've got a plan, a much better plan. There you go. Wow. Leave it to the Brits. We built it, we fix it. Where did you come from? Okay.